Well, you probably didn't know you were going to get a double header. And, uh, but we're so glad that you're here to be part of today. That we see today is just our opportunity just to breathe life into you. That there is something powerful about a conference like this because you can just take in, because so much of what you do is you just give out and you give out and you serve. And there's something powerful about being in a setting like this where you just take in. And what I find is, is that some of the most amazing things that happen, some of the mind-blowing things for me are not even in these sessions. It's in the margins. It's over lunch. It is during the time where you're hanging out with people. It's at the snack time. It is this comment that somebody makes that will just re-energize you. It, it'll be this comment that, that somebody speaks into you that will help you to keep going. It's something that, that somebody says that you have this learning that then propels you forward. And so it is just such a good thing that we're here doing this together and uh, being a part of this. So again, as, as others have said, thank you for, for giving your day just to be filled up, to be forged today. It's, as I was thinking about this, this talk right here, I was thinking about my history in ministry. My first real leadership role that I had as a leader was in high school. Um, my student ministry pastor knew that I wanted to be a youth pastor, and so he came to me when I was a sophomore in high school, and he goes, listen, Shane, if you think you want to be a pastor, you don't just start this someday, you start it right now. And so when I was a sophomore in high school, I started leading out what at my church would be Kids Crossing, the Sunday morning program for elementary kids. So I, I came in, it was just our children's ministry service. I did that every single Sunday. I would come in and I would teach a bunch of kids, and I started getting my feet wet in ministry. I graduated from high school early, and I went to college. And that first spring, when I should have still been in high school, but I was in my first semester in seminary, there was a church nearby the school, about halfway between where my hometown was and the seminary that I was going to. They were looking for a part-time student ministry pastor, somebody who could come in on Saturday and Sunday and lead the student ministry at this little church. And so this church was kind of putting feelers out. And another youth pastor in another church that just knew me from growing up gave them my name. And so I went and I interviewed to become the student ministry pastor. And I felt so self-conscious. I didn't tell them how old I was. I mean, they just like, well, he's a high school kid. Well, the truth is I should have, I mean, he's a college kid. The truth is I was a high school kid who happened to be in college, and so I'm leading these kids in the student ministry who are older than me, but I would never tell them how old I was. I mean, I, I just never would, and Darla and I, we loved it, and, and we served there until I had the opportunity to do an internship in Oklahoma, and I thought this internship was going to turn into um, a full-time ministry when I graduated, and the church had some changes, and I remember the elders came to me one Sunday, and they go, hey, you know, we've decided that we can't wait until you graduate in a year and a half. Do you want today to be your last day? I'm like, what? I, I thought I had a full-time job, and I just got fired. I, I mean, what just happened to me? And then Darla and I, um, we took my, our, our first full-time ministry in St. Louis, this little suburb outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And Darla and I, we served there for five and a half years, and we loved them. We love those people. We thought that we were going to be there forever. Our youngest two kids, our, both of our girls, were born there during that ministry. And when I was 26 years old, I got the opportunity to come to Canyon Ridge Christian Church to be their first student ministry pastor. And after serving there for six years, Canyon and Central came together and, and they sent us out to start the crossing 22 years ago. And so I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. He's never had a real job. I know that's such what's going through your mind. That I have been blessed to do vocational ministry, to make a living doing vocational ministry for 36 years. And I've had some incredible moments. 
you're kind, stop it. Um, I've had some incredible moments in those 36 years. And I've been suicidal at times during that journey. I've walked through higher highs than I ever dreamed. And I walked through deeper pain than I ever thought was possible. And what I'm going to share with you in these next few minutes is what has been forged out of those experiences, those, those years. That as today's theme is forged, and forge only, forging only happens in the heat, as Lee was talking about. It's that process of heating to the right point and then cooling. If you heat it too much, it's ruined. But if you don't heat it enough, it's, well, it won't become stronger. That's leadership. That's leadership. If you don't go through difficult times, you will not grow. And if you don't pull back from the stress, you will burn out. So as we talk about leadership that lasts, I just want to give you what I've discovered are the three secrets of lasting leadership. Just these three secrets of lasting leadership. And and here's this first one. This first one is just calling. It's just your calling. Before we started the crossing, as we were getting ready to, to launch the crossing, I was preaching at Canyon Ridge, and we were giving that vision to, to start this brand new church. And so I got up there, and I just said, because I didn't want anybody to think that I was trying to hurt the ministry of Canyon Ridge, and so I just said, you know, if you're supposed to be at Canyon Ridge, you stay here, you know, Canyon Ridge. It, I don't want to take you from this church, but for some of you, God might be calling you to help launch the crossing. Well, one of the guys who actually became one of my dear friends and later became a pastor himself, he said to his wife, he goes, I was thinking that we should go to the crossing, but no one ever called me. And she's like, oh, Jim. You know, that's that's not what that meant. When Shane said, you know, if you feel called to go to the crossing... You didn't need to be waiting by your phone to see if somebody was going to call you to go to the crossing. So maybe you've heard that term before and it's confusing to you. So let me just give you a definition of calling. This is a definition right here. Calling is a God-given conviction about your life's direction. That's what a calling is. It's a God-given conviction about your life's calling. When when Darla and I came and interviewed at Canyon Ridge in 1994, the church was just a year old. Mike Bro um, is the one who started um, Canyon Ridge. And what's interesting is, is Jody Hickerson, who was just here speaking to us a couple weeks ago, that's Mike Bro's daughter. So Jody was in my student ministry when she was 14 years old at Canyon Ridge. And, uh, and now she's in her 40s. And so that just makes me, it just kind of weirds me out. I'm so old. And, uh, and so... They were looking for the student ministry pastor. Our youngest daughter was six weeks old, so we come in tow with our six-week-old new baby, and, and uh, we, we uh, stay out on the strip for a couple nights, and then Mike takes us to the very top of Summerlin Parkway. And <clears throat> at the very top of Summerlin Parkway, you can see the lights of the valley. Well, of course, there was no lights on this side of the valley because, you know, it didn't exist yet. But he quoted a scripture that comes out of the Gospel of John where he says the fields are white under harvest. As we're looking at all these white lights over Las Vegas. And I felt God's calling so strongly that it would have been disobedience to not come. And when bro offered me the job, he said, Shane, we think you're the guy who's supposed to come. But let me just tell you, um, I'm not going to tell you how much you're going to make. He said... I'm only going to tell you we're going to take care of your needs. But you need to have such a strong calling that money won't be a part of your decision. And for me, it was this burning bush calling. I remember we were, in, we were meeting in Cimarron High School, and I was right over here on that Sunday morning in that audience. And Darla and I were just weeping because we know that God is moving us to come to Las Vegas to be part of that brand new church. Um. But I don't think a calling is always like that. When we started the crossing, it wasn't like that. It was this process of elimination. I had this church in Indiana come, and they wanted me to be their senior pastor, and I met with them, and I'm like, I just don't know if I want to make people mad at getting rid of their hymns and their organ. I just don't know if that's for me. (laughs) 
And so it was at that moment, you know, I'm like, is it existing church or is it a church plant? We decide we think we want to go with the church plant. We want to start a new church. Well, then I had this church planting organization in Colorado call me, and they said, we think you're the guy. And so we went and interviewed, and they said, we have $450,000 in the banks to get everything started for you to go. You're the guy. Let's go. And we also, you know, just love this city. And we thought, man, this is a done deal, but we think we're supposed to stay here. And so for us, it was a process of elimination. And your calling in ministry might look like one of those. That maybe you knew exactly where you were supposed to be. It was like God designed you for the role that you're in right now. Or maybe it's just this process of elimination. You try a ministry and you go, well, that's not a good fit. You know, you, you hold babies and you go, I hate babies. And so, you know, it's like I, I'm going to try something else. And it's this process of elimination. See, here's why a calling is important. Here's what I've learned is when everything falls apart, and it will, you need a calling to fall back on. Because in those moments, here's what we'll say. We'll just go, it's not worth it. I quit. I'm done. I'd rather go somewhere else. But it's your calling that you lean into when you have nothing else to lean into. A a calling is says that I'm going to stay under the pressure until God calls me somewhere else or until he releases me from my calling, okay? That's what a calling is. Okay, number two, here's the second secret of lasting leadership. It's just what I call longevity, longevity. Um, Darla and I moved to Vegas, as I said, 28 years ago, and I started out at Canyon Ridge when I was 26 years old, and I had kids who were in my student ministry that I helped lead them to Christ. I had the opportunity to baptize them, I did their weddings, and I dedicated their children. I buried their parents. I've walked through through highs and lows. We've gone through celebrations and addictions and divorce. And there's just something powerful about making a commitment to a place and loving people over a long period of time. And let me tell you about the, the very first prayer that ever happened in this room right here. I was part of a CEO group for, for years, and in this group, um, there was about 16 of us that, uh, that were leaders of our companies. They were all CEOs. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm, it's like a pastor, but I kind of, you know, skimmed in there. And so we would meet every month for training and wisdom and all of that. And the reason I was part of this group was two reasons. Number one is, is uh, it forced me to work on my leadership at least one day a month. And number two, it helped me to be around people who are far from Jesus. Well, one of the ladies who was in our group, um, that uh, she had this cohort of college friends that uh, they all had the same major, and so they were, they were trek- trekking through all of these classes together. Then they did internships together and graduated. They were in each other's weddings. And so there was nine. It was a cohort of, of I believe, 12 people. And so as they all graduated, there were a bunch of them that went to New York to do um, their first residencies, and they were all in the same tower on 9-11, and she lost nine of her friends on 9-11. And so for years, every September 11th, when it came along, she would just spend the month in depression. She couldn't get out of bed. Well, we were building this building at that point right then, and, and uh, I happened to be hosting that leadership gathering here at the Crossing on 9-11 of that particular year. And she came, which was a big step for her because she had never come in September during those years before. And during one of the breaks, she just pulled me aside and she said, hey, Shane, would you just pray for me at the end of the day? And you just have no idea what a big deal that was because she was not a believer in Jesus. I'm like, absolutely. So we ended the day, and I took everybody on a tour of our whole campus And we ended the tour of the campus right here in the middle of this auditorium. It was a construction zone. Everything was just in disarray. And we were six months from moving in. And uh, as we were leaving, one of the guys who was also a Christian, we're all leaving. And he goes, I thought we were praying over Kate. And and I was like, oh, I, I thought that was to be done privately. 
And so Kate goes, well, I don't care. Anybody can pray with me that wants to. Well, I gave everyone an out. You know, I said, if, if you feel uncomfortable, you can leave. But if you want to stay, we'll just pray over Kate. No one left. I don't know where they felt awkward. You know, like, oh, I'm anti-God. I'm walking out of here. Or they wanted to be here. I, I don't know. And so everybody's standing around like deer caught in headlights. They, they don't know what to do. And so I said, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to gather around Kate. We're going to put our hands on her. We're going to pray for her. Uh, it's something I will never forget. So we had these Christians and non-Christians who were right here laying hands on Kate. And we pray for Kate on that day. Well, it was amazing because it wasn't anything that I had orchestrated. It was just one of those moments that God gives you in time. That these moments happen in relationships over a long period of time. They trusted me. They trusted that I wasn't going to do anything weird. They, I'd just been there for a long time. It's interesting because the Apostle Paul had his longest ministries in Ephesus and Corinth, which were the most sinful places of his day. That's why Paul and the elders are weeping in Acts chapter 20 because he's saying goodbye to them. He says, you will never see me again. And they are weeping. They're at the beach and they are weeping because Paul had spent his longest ministry with these people. See, the opportunities I've had in ministry in Vegas are not let me get this straight. The opportunities that I've had to do ministry here in Vegas are not because I'm all that talented. It's not because I have anything super unique to say. It's just I've just stuck around for a long time. That's it. You want to know the secret of lasting leadership? It's just hanging around for a long time and being faithful. It really is. There's something powerful about making a commitment to a place and to people and loving them over a long period of time. Here's this third secret of leadership that lasts. It's just this. It's just your life. It is your life. Um, I have given thousands and sermons and lessons over the years. Thousands of them. I, I don't know if we had this video or not. I don't know if we were able to get it uploaded. So this right here, these books that you see, this is every sermon that I've given at the crossing over these 22 years. Can you play that again and put it on the big screen? Is there, can we do that? So each one of those are years. Those are my original manuscripts. I've had them all bound. And, uh, and so that's every single sermon I've ever done. Now, let me tell you, there is actually a couple good messages that are in there, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you. Most of them are pretty forgettable, okay? They, they really are. I, I remember the first time that I, I spoke at Canyon Ridge, and I'm 26 years old, and I was scared to death, and, and I was so stressed because I knew I had to be funny and have the right stories and be emotional and, you know, have something good to say. I remember the first time I spoke at Central, and they, uh, they allowed me to come in. I remember the first time I spoke at their new building. They were running like 5,000 people. I'd never spoken in front of even half that many people before, and I was so scared. And I remember, remember the first time that, that I, I did this big high school conference, and, you know, it's like I got to have, you know, this story and that story, and I got to have this joke here. And what I've learned over the years is my messages about marriage or purity or conflict resolution were not nearly as powerful as my marriage and my purity and the way that I work through conflict. See, there's expectations of, uh, of every family, every family. So when we had kids, there was never expectations of our kids because they were pastor's kids. Now, everybody else in the church does. I mean, they're like, well, you're the pastor's kid. You know, so we want you to, but we just didn't. Our expectations were never about my job. There was never a conversation where we said, well, because dad's a pastor, you can't do this. You have to do this. We never had those conversations. You can ask my kids. The conversations were, because we are followers of Jesus, this is how we act. This is what we do. That, 
The expectation was to honor Jesus with our lives. It didn't matter what I did for a living. That we live like we live, not because of my job. We live like we live because we have surrendered our lives to Jesus. Your impact as a leader is only as strong as your life. Your impact as a leader is only as strong as your life. It doesn't matter whether you sing on stage, whether you teach, whether you lead a small group, whether you're part of our guest services team. It doesn't matter whether you do production, whatever it is. If you implode your life, your impact implodes with that. Your impact, it implodes with that. Darla and I celebrated our 35th anniversary this past Christmas. And uh, and I have been faithful to her for 35 years. And you might go, well, that's easy. You're a pastor. Okay? That would be giving me way too much credit. It's, it's not, it wasn't an accident. It is no secret that I don't go to lunch or dinner alone with another woman. I, I don't ride in a car or travel alone with another woman. Has it been awkward at times? Yes. I've had people, hey, do you ever do lunch? No. Dinner? No. Breakfast? No. Ever? Never. You know, I just don't. Here's why. Because if I implode my life, it not only affects me, it affects thousands of other people. My credibility as a pastor is gone. Now, am I saying that it's a sin to have lunch with the opposite sex? No, I'm not saying that. It may be what your job requires of you. You need a list. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy. It says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Every person that I know who's imploded their life, it's been one of these two things. It's been one of these two things. That, let me start with the second one, your doctrine. Watch your doctrine closely. Closely. Your doctrine just means your teaching, your instruction. Here's what happens with so many people. That you have your life and you have what God's word says. And so when these two things collide, you can either adjust your life to God's word or you adjust God's word to fit into your life. See, this is what we're seeing so often today. That there are certain people who that they live their lives in such a way that doesn't fit into Scripture, so they've adjusted God's Word to fit into their lifestyle. Or they find a book that says that what they're doing is okay, or another spiritual leader. Paul says, watch your doctrine closely. But he starts off by saying, watch your life. Watch your life. A lot of times we say, well, I can live my life however I want. Not if you're a follower of Jesus. Not if you're a follower of Jesus. It's not your life. You were bought at a price. Your life impacts not just you. See, the way that you live your life impacts everyone who is in your life. The greatest message you have is your life. It is your life. So, today... Which one of these three do you maybe need to lean into the most? Do you need to reaffirm your calling today? Your calling into ministry. We're all ministers. You're in ministry. Maybe you need to reaffirm your calling into ministry. Maybe it's this whole idea of longevity. It's just it's time to make a commitment saying, I'm here through thick and thin, through the good and the bad. I'm here. I'm going to serve these people. They're going to see me. Maybe there's something in your life or your teaching that you need to pay attention to. Do you need to change something about your life or your doctrine? Is there something that needs to change so that you can fit into what God wants you to be? So I, I just want to pray for you. And... And we're going to sing, then we're going to go into a break. But maybe it's just one of these three things. God is forging in you something. He's heating and cooling.
Today, we want this to be a moment where you are forged into a lasting leadership. God, thank you for these men and women who not only call the crossing home, they make the crossing what it is. But they serve and they give and they love all in the name of Jesus. So God, we praise you for who you are. God, we, we give you our hearts and our souls. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.